Today we're looking at hindrances to serving. We looked several weeks ago at Jesus, the greatest of all, is the greatest servant of all. We saw that he washed feet, and this, of course, was an example to us. But the greatest example of service we find in verse 28, he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And we know he did this on the cross. So Jesus, the greatest of all, served in the greatest capacity of all. And we are to serve like Jesus. We looked at your talents, seeing that, yes, every person has a talent. We do not all have the same talents. The Lord is the giver of the talents. We should make use of our talents. Then there's the law of gain and loss with our talents. And it's since we are entrusted with the talents of another, it is certain that there will be an accounting day. Well, we emphasized last week we are to serve God and others. Yes, serve God. That's what Christians do but also we are to serve others. And as you find Paul as an example, he was the servant of all. And ultimately his purpose in being that servant of all was to save some. We find he did this even to the point of sacrifice, being glad to do it. And so we need to be serving, being God's hands and God's feet. But as you consider serving, you know, there are times where people, they're hindered. Maybe, maybe it's something of their own doing that hinders them. Maybe it's something of someone else's doing that hinders them. Maybe nobody's to blame. But it's just like something gets in the way of them and serving. So I want us to look at several of these hindrances today. First of all, a hindrance is I'm physically and mentally tired. Many years ago, I preached a lesson about spiritual growth. And one of the points was, you know, every year we really ought to, as it were, have a little more knowledge, having been a little more active in God's work. Well, afterwards, a very good and godly lady came to me and she says, you know what you said really frustrated me. She said, I don't have the memory I used to. I used to could quote verses and tell you where they're from, and I just don't have the memory I used to. I used to teach Bible class, and I used to, and she mentioned several other things, but she says, I just don't have the strength and stamina that I used to. Well, you know, she was right. At this point in her life, she was physically and mentally tired. By the way, this lady was Lily Turner who is an amazing example. Just to give you an illustration, she had dealt with cancer. Life was difficult for her. She would not go anywhere on Saturday, so she would be able to come on Sunday. Day like today, when we're eating, she wouldn't stay and eat. She just said, I don't have the energy and the stamina to stay another hour and then be able to get back later this afternoon. And I want to be here at 5 o'clock. She was dealing with the lack of strength and mind and still serving in the best capacity she could. I'll tell you another man, miss him dearly. J.T. Norton, one of the elders at Easter Meadows for many years. He actually battled three different kinds of cancer before one day dying of a heart attack. He was retired when I arrived at Easter Meadows in 1987. And already at that point, he wasn't the man he used to be as far as physical strength and stamina And he woke up every morning and he'd say he just had to almost bend and move every joint of his body until he could get to moving. But you know, almost every day it seemed like he would be at the church building doing something. And it was often very mundane things. Maybe it was even working in the flowers or the gardening about the building. But he would be there. 
Now over the period of time, he was there less because as I mentioned, he was getting older, he battled three different kinds of cancer, but the day he died, he had been repairing something in our building, went home. Sarah Marie knew that you know, he had driven into the driveway, but he didn't come inside. And so after a few minutes, she went out, and there she found him, laying there. He had already passed away. But the last thing he had been doing, serving and working for the Lord. You know, we may be getting physically, mentally tired, but let's still use what we have to serve. Another hindrance. Somebody says, I don't have time. I just got too many things to do. Overcommitted. You know, sometimes it's the job itself. Many people work far more than 40 hours. Sometimes 60, 70 hours a week. And there's little time for anything else. Or maybe somebody's hobby, you know, hunting. I don't think you'll find anything like that to kill around here, by the way. But sometimes it kind of overtakes. Or maybe it's, i got to watch the ball game. Not this kind, though, because that's soccer. Or maybe it's, you know, Little League. It is very time-consuming for the children and for the parents. Or maybe it's shopping, or maybe it's camping. Many years ago, I had a preacher friend, and he says, I'm frustrated. I said, what's wrong? He says, we have got, and by the way, the church where he was preaching, about 125, maybe 150, but he said, we got six to eight families that have campers, and nearly every week in the summer, they're gone. He says, how do we grow when we got a significant number of our families that are off camping? You know what all these things have in common? There's not a one of them that's wrong. All the way from the work, that first example, to the camping, not a one of them's wrong. In fact, many of these things I would commend to you. But when they overtake our lives and our time and we have no more time and energy, and so someone says, we need you to help with this. Could you serve in this capacity? Could you teach this class? Could you? And we say, no, I don't have time. But well, we have time for all these other things. Sometimes I've heard it said, people have time for what they want to have time for. Many times that's true. The overcommitment, oftentimes, you know, we do that to ourselves. Somebody says, wait a minute. One thing you didn't put up here was church. And somebody else might say, wait, wait, wait. We're talking about serving the Lord. How could we be overcommitted to the church? Do you realize that we're going to talk about this a little bit later? We're not careful. Sometimes we can be so busy sometimes that some activities, they're church-related. Not, we're not doing sometimes the more important things. Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Our first commitment is God. And if our first commitment is God, we don't get overcommitted to other things that keep us from serving God. Another hindrance. I have prior commitments. Now this is kind of an odd thing to talk about here. Prior, more important. Now somebody might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're talking about serving God. What's more important than serving God? Do you realize there was a time, book of Acts... When the apostles said, we can't do that. By the way, what they didn't have time to do, they asked somebody else to do it. So it was needful and it was worthy and it was important to the church, but they said, we don't have time for it. Because there can be 
commitments of greater priority. And the reality is you cannot do it all. You can be overcommitted to things that are nothing related to the Lord's work. Could be even you're committed to things that are the Lord's work and omitting more important things. This is Acts 6, 1 through 4. Look at this now. Now in those days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists came against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, now look at this. It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. In other words, the elders were acknowledging, excuse me, the, the apostles were acknowledging this work to be done. It's good, it's needful, it's necessary, but they were also acknowledging God's given us something prior, something more important, that if we do this, we are not doing this, not having the time for it. It's not right that we should give up preaching the Word of God to serve tables. And then there was the instruction, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, that we may devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Let us never let serving God... Be a hindrance to us serving God. And we need to recognize there are some things that are, they can be more important than some other things. We have Monday night motivation. That's once a month. We've finished it for 2018. Some of us meet here and we have a meal and we have a class. I would love it if somebody would call and say, would you explain my absence? I've got a Bible study with somebody on Monday night. I'd love it if half a dozen folks would maybe speak to someone and say, tell folks I'd be there, but we're going to be making some visits we hope that will lead to Bible studies. The apostles recognized their prior commitments, and I can't let other things hinder me from getting that job done. Another hindrance. I'm tired of doing it all by myself. It can be discouraging when you feel that you're doing it all by yourself. I have an idea that if you haven't heard that, you have experienced it yourself. You're doing it, it needs to be done. But yet you see the other folks, they're not doing it. And you're not seeing as well what they're doing. So you're thinking, why am I having to do this by myself? Do you recall the story of Mary and Martha, beginning in Luke 10, beginning in verse 38? Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village, Bethany, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. Now in this story, we're going to see that the Lord points out that in this circumstance, Mary's chosen the good part of listening to Jesus. But Martha is doing something that's commendable in the fact that she is, is serving, but, but right now Jesus is there. But I want you to see about Martha and, and, and how she's feeling. In verse 40 it says, Martha was distracted with all her preparations. She came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me? to do all the serving alone. Now this I took the New American Standard Bible because it really had the best rendition of this passage. Most other translations just to serve alone. But the Greek verb there, it might not mean much to many of you, not a whole lot to me, but if it's present infinitive, that kind of should jump out at 
the person reading or seeing the Greek text because it means it's continuous, continuous, continuous. And so when she says to serve alone, it's like, I'm always doing this serving by myself. In fact, when I see this, I almost get a little bit of a picture of Mary and Martha, that Martha's that one who is always cumbered about with serving, and Mary, not so much. Her sister doing it, why should she? In this circumstance, Jesus was there, and they both needed to be sitting at Jesus' feet. But what she bothered about, I'm always doing it by myself. That's what she's bothered with. And that will sometimes hinder people today because what happens if people begin, begin to think that way? Eventually they say, I'm not going to do it either. I'm not going to do it either. Now, like I said, in this story, they both should have been listening to Jesus. But it does kind of let us in on this idea of I'm doing it all by myself, all the time, and I'm tired of it. That's a hindrance. Another hindrance sometimes to serving is, is I don't feel that I'm needed. It can be discouraging when you don't value your place and realize that you're needed in the body of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, beginning of verse 6, 15. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. You know, somebody's thinking, I can't do what you do. And so, I'm not needed. And so I'll just go home. I'm not a part of you. I don't feel I'm needed. The point here, yes, you are needed. You can't do what he can do. You can't do what she can do. But what you can do, you're needed to do. Don't ever, ever, ever feel you're not needed. Now it could be you just, in and of yourself, you feel that way. Sometimes you feel that way because of others. And that kind of gets to the next point. Sometimes you might feel, I'm not wanted. I don't feel I'm wanted. See, it can be discouraging when it seems that others act as if you have no place, no function, no value in the body. You see, the next little section, verse 21 says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. You see, when somebody says, I don't need you, here's what you're hearing. What you're hearing is, I don't want you. You're of no importance to me. And that's hurtful and it's harmful and it's a hindrance. It's a hindrance to serving. The reality is you get to there in that passage of 1 Corinthians 12 and there's no better passage to emphasize the need of every individual in the Lord's body. And even if sometimes, you see, this is hitting the heart of it. If they don't seem as needful or as important, they are needful. They are important. And everyone functioning as they can, then the body is healthy and working and as God would have it be. Don't ever be thinking, I don't feel I'm needed. And don't ever be thinking, I don't feel that I'm wanted. Yes, you are needed. And whether others make you feel wanted, God makes you feel wanted. Then somebody just says, I just can't do it. I can't do it. You know, it's not they're saying, I will not. Oftentimes that's really the problem is they're not willing. They say, I cannot do it. And it may not be physical. Maybe physically they cannot do it. But sometimes it can even be psychological and emotional. Maybe it's even their personality. It's kind of the who they are. And they find it very, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to do what's asked of them. 
This can be demonstrated by various personality types. Now, no, in this amount of time, we're not going to study personality types, but here, here's four in this particular kind of overview of personality types. And everybody fits into one or one in some of the other. And sometimes a person may initially think, hmm, I, I, I read about this personality and that one, and that, I don't know which one I am. Well, I want to say if you read through these enough, eventually you're going to probably say, well, I'm probably that. And I know that's too small for you to see. I went over the time, but when he talks about strengths and weaknesses, it's a reality. It's a reality. In fact, kind of so much so, Tracy Moore wrote a book about it. Tracy Moore graduated from Fault University and also Ambridge University. And he wrote a book several years after it was written, finally got published. When we were uh, at Hat Church of Christ on Wednesday night a few weeks ago before the ladies' retreat at Any Creek Youth Camp, uh, they were studying this that Wednesday night, this me and you and the people in the pews. And it's a book that talks about personality types, talks about some Bible characters and maybe which they could be, but then also how it affects us in the church. And then one of the statements towards, well, towards the end of the book, page 88, says it isn't fair to ask a sanguine to organize a program at the church just because they came up with the idea. Nor is it fair to ask the melancholy to promote the works they organize. To put a phlegmatic as the leader because no one else will step up is dangerous. And to ask a choleric to work on a project that demands great patience would be like a bull loose in a china shop. Ship, shop. Well, I need to type better and proof better. Now, somebody might say, where's the Bible for this? It's just recognizing how people differ and putting them how they're best suited to be. But as we were in that Bible class, there was a lady sitting in the pew next to Tish, and there was discussion about, you know, how we serve in our personalities, and then she spoke up, and I really appreciate what she said. She said that, there's a lot of things she's done that she didn't feel comfortable doing. A lot of things that she did, she didn't particularly just want to do, but she did them because she believed God wanted her to do them. That they were a part of Christian service. And so she was determined to kind of, to, to, to kind of push through just the limitations of her personality. And I would hope we would be that way. There is the point sometimes I can't do it. Maybe so. But sometimes maybe we can, as it were, realizing the greater goal and the greater good and that God would desire this for us, that we push through and do it. But sometimes our personalities can dictate sometimes what we do and don't do. Then sometimes, and you've probably heard of this, where somebody just says, I can't work with him. And they're talking about kind of conflicts of personalities. And if you've not heard this before, in some context, you probably will eventually. And it can even happen, yes, in the church context. You know, as you read about Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15, 36 to 41, well, that could be possibly an example as they separated over the disagreement to take John Mark on the second missionary journey. And at that particular juncture, it was almost like, no, I can't work with you. I'm going to go here. You're going to go there. They were both in fellowship. They both loved each other. And we might say, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And God's work was still being done. In fact, maybe to a greater degree. But yet at that particular point, they differed with and they separated. And when people have conflicts, sometimes, yes, that can be a hindrance as well. And then, of course, you know, procrastination. You know, that's an, I'll do it later, but later never comes. Well, this passage in Luke 9, 59 through 62 is kind of very clear about that. He says, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Then a second situation. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those in my home. Jesus said to him, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. You know, it's almost to hear, I'll do it later, and the later never comes, procrastination. Heard it one time said that, you know, the devil met with his 
angels, the demons, and said, okay, how can we best keep people from obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ? Somebody said, preach, there's no God. He said, well, you know, that'll work for some, but not for everybody. Well, how about we just say that Jesus wasn't really resurrected? He said, no, there's enough proofs. So many will still believe. Then finally, somebody just speaks up and says, I tell you, here's what we'll do. We'll tell them to believe, but we'll tell them about that obedience, just do it later. Just do it later, and that'll get them every time. Too many times that's true. Procrastination. I'll do it later, and with good intentions, but the later never comes. You know, there's all kinds of other hindrances that somebody might bring up. Maybe pride, or I didn't get my way, or, you know, here the big one is I don't want to. That's not quite said as often as it is, is probably the reality. And you might list all kinds of other things, but there are things that are hindrances to serving. They get in the way. What do I want to do? I want to get beyond the hindrances. And I want to be serving God. I want to get beyond the hindrances. And I want to be of value to the Lord's church. I want to get beyond the hindrances. And I want to be that that function that I can provide, whether it's the foot or the hand or the mouth or whatever. And I hope that you'd want to also get beyond the hindrances, no matter what they are, to be serving God. Would you begin this morning to be God's servant? You know, if you're going to really be God's servant, you've got to be one of His people. You've got to be in His church. You need to be a Christian need to be saved. And we just ask you to do what was said to do. It's reading the book of Acts. Day of Pentecost. When they said, what should we do? He told them, repent and be baptized. And so today, with faith, we ask you to repent and be baptized. And we can assist you in that baptism this morning. Or if there's need for prayer, be glad to pray for you. If you need to come, please come as we stand and sing.